Okay, now I've got recording turned on. So we're gonna talk about the Stirling engine timeline. We're gonna talk about lesson five and some of the stuff that's in that. So let us begin. So I've got SolidWorks open and for cut revolves, I mean, they're really simple. I mean, basically any way that you can make geometry, you can also cut. So for extrude bosses, you can make solids. You can do cut extrudes. Same thing with revolves. You can do a revolve and create you know, shaft-like objects or the wine bottle. You can also do cuts. So let's do a very typical thing. We're gonna do a shaft with an E-ring retaining groove. Could you uh, show us as well? Uh, I thought I, yeah, I am sharing my screen right now. Not seeing it? I'm not, but it's probably just me. Uh, see. I'm not sure how you do a screen refresh. Here, I'll tell you what, I'll stop sharing and now I'll reshare it. Are you seeing it now? Yeah, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, no problem. Okay, so I just opened up any old generic empty part. I've created sketch one on the right plane. I'll grab a circle, put it on the origin. Always, 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 smart to mention it. So I'm gonna create a one inch circle. Get out of the sketch, go to features, we'll extrude it. There you go. And I will turn on my axes. They were just hidden. Okay, so an E-ring groove or a snap ring groove. E-rings are commonly used to retain shafts and machinery so they can't slide axially. If that means nothing to you, they look like this, any one of these. So these are called E-rings. They go around the outside of a shaft. They also have ones that go on the inside of tubing or pipe, something like this. You have special little pliers that squeeze the two, two little circles together. You put them in, they pop open, and they can hold really, really nicely. So there's the background of where we're going. Now I'm gonna do a sketch on the front plane. I'll use the normal two option. And this is very much like using a lathe cutting tool. Same story. I've got to locate my object in space and size it. I'll just accept those defaults. So I have a fully defined sketch as always. I'll exit the sketch. So I'm gonna take this closed region and I'm gonna revolve it about axis four and I'm gonna create a cutout in the shaft. So we'll do a revolve cut. We choose what we're gonna spin about, which is the blue box. I'll click on axis four, there's the preview. And I'll say, okay. And now I have a groove in my shaft. And really, it, it's just that simple. It, this is not a hard function. Okay. If I wanted to, if I wanted to control the depth and how far in I cut into the shaft, whoops, I don't want to be in there. I could get rid of the 390. And I can go from the top of the shaft. And maybe I only wanted a 16th of an inch into the shaft. I could do that. 
that's probably the more realistic way to dimension it. Okay, and that's extrude cut. So I have a feeling you will see this, make sure you know it. Uh, and there you go. Okay, so that was cut revolve. Not super hard. <coughs> now we're gonna jump topics again. One of the things I didn't talk about last time was your Sterling engine project. And I should have. So in regards to the Sterling engine, okay, you guys are going to be given a baggie full of parts, which you can use however you want. So there'll be some uh, stiff music wire in there. There'll be some safety wire. There'll be a couple of pipe elbows. There'll be some stuff in there. Okay, but you're gonna have to prove to me that you have a design before you get your baggie. And I want you to execute this project just like any other big project. Okay, so that means you gotta put a project plan together. You gotta tell me when stuff is gonna be due and you're gonna be graded on how well you stick to that. One of the most common tools that we use for project planning is called a Gantt chart. And I'm gonna go over to lesson five. And I should have showed you this last time. So it's actually under lesson four, I apologize. And last year when I went over this, I didn't do a good job, okay? I asked the students to create their project plan and they didn't really understand how they're gonna actually use SolidWorks to do it. So I'm gonna do a more simplified example that you guys are more familiar with. We're gonna talk about making brownies. So if I wanna make brownies and I wanna have my brownies ready at a certain time, I'm gonna start with when I want them or when I expect to have them ready and I'm gonna work backward and I'm gonna list all of the things that I have to do to make brownies. So for example, if I want brownies by, in this case, in Google Sheets, If I want brownies by 75 minutes from now, these are all the steps and here's how long each one is gonna take. So I'm gonna start off by preheating my oven to 350 and then concurrently, I can get out my dishes, I can grease the baking pan and I'm saying it's gonna take one minute to grease the baking pan, okay. Maybe it doesn't take a full 60 seconds, but that is a t the units of time up here that work out well. I'm gonna get out my ingredients, so I'll get the, the mix out, I'll get the eggs out, get the oil out. I'll break the eggs, mix the batter for another minute. I'll put the raw brownies in the oven. I'm gonna bake them for this yellow bar amount of time. It takes 60 minutes to make brownies. I'm gonna pull them out. I'm gonna let them cool for, uh, what have I got, three minutes, four minutes. I'll slice them. I'll give myself a minute for that. Then I'm gonna eat them. I'm gonna burn my tongue and I'm gonna to go to the emergency room to get my tongue fixed. So I'm looking for the same thing from you guys. So you're going to develop a plan. Oh. Question out there? So in your case, what you're gonna do is you're gonna research the different types of Stirling engines. You gotta choose a final type. 
And for milestones, you can just use an asterisk, and which says on week three, I'm going to have a type finalized and say, I'm going to build this one. That's all the star means. So right now you've got almost everything you need to draw the models. You could draw a whole bunch of them with just what you know right now. Once you get the models done, then you're going to be able to do the piece part blueprints for things like the soda cans and the wires and all of that. So you'll also have to do the assembly. We're going to take and draw each part. Um, I have to check the syllabus. We're going to draw each part. We're going to assemble them. We're going to do drafting. You're going to have to do an assembly drawing to show me where every component goes and how it gets installed, whether there's glue that needs to be applied. You got to tell me all of that stuff in the final project. Okay, so I want you to think through all of that. You're going to build your engine from your blueprints. You always have to have time for debugging in there. And presentation, that'll be another milestone. That should be sometime in your final week. Finals and breathe a sigh of relief that the class is over. I wouldn't break it down any more fine than like week to week. So just think about the process of drawing models, making prints, making assemblies, making assembly prints. Make sure that you do all of that before you build the engine, give yourself time for debugging. And all you got to do is color in these little regions on the spreadsheet. We're not going to get fancy. So to do that, just highlight the areas and you can come up here to fill color and just give it a color. That's it. If you need to get rid of it, you make a mistake, you can come back up to fill color and hit reset. It'll turn it back to white. So you should have some kind of step down uh, color pattern that gets you right to week 16. Then around Thanksgiving, I'm going to sit down with each of you, probably via Zoom, and I'm going to say, okay, show me your model, show me your prints, and I'm going to look at what you promised me, and I'm going to say, okay, you either stayed on your timeline or you didn't, and you'll get a grade for that, for staying on target. Okay, this is just like the real world. We did the same thing on the F-35 Lightning II program. We had a Gantt chart. We promised stuff on certain dates and we got rated on how we met our, our milestones. Okay, does that remotely make sense to you guys? Yes. You get, okay, I have one yes out there. So when are we doing this by? Okay, I want this for your next homework submission. So next Monday at 8 a.m. Okay. Um, Professor Abadessa. Sir. What is the uh, type of Sterling engine that you have available for viewing inside of the fishbowl? What is that referred to as? <sighs> If you go to YouTube and just Google soda can Sterling engine. In fact, let's just do that. We'll close this, get rid of this. Um, You could do any one of these. I would avoid the multi-cylinders, but like this simple Coke can Sterling engine, if you wanted to do one like that, yeah, go for it. And the only thing that I'm probably gonna have to give you guys is the crankshaft dimensions. So there's a bend that moves the displacer piece up and down 
that needs to go up and down three eighths of an inch. And then this little bend right here, that needs to be three sixteenths of an inch in any one of these typical uh, two soda can varieties. And these guys go through taking it apart, they show you what's inside, all of that stuff. Okay. I see a bunch of glazed over faces. No, I was just looking at all the videos. Okay. What if I want a V12 Sterling engine? <laughs> I tell you what, I'll give you the baggie. If you want to kick in some extra parts, go for it. Uh, I would even, for a V12, I would even give you some extra welding rod and stuff like that just to see that thing run. That would be quite impressive. The level of power of this little steam powered engine. Uh, steam would be a pain in the butt, but you could do it. I've often thought about one of these three cylinders. These would be quite, quite impressive. So take a look at the different Sterlings. You guys probably have no idea what I'm talking about right now, but look at some videos. Next time we get together, ask questions. And maybe I should even do a video of taking mine apart so that you can see what's inside the thing. And I'll show you one that actually runs. So I'll take that as an action item. What are you considering to be week one? Uh, week one is when I said, hi, welcome to MEE 120, I'm your instructor. Okay. Okay, so we did cut revolve. So next week, 8 a.m., I want your Sterling engine timeline of what you're gonna have done when. Now let's go over to lesson five, which is what we should be doing today which is patterning. And you guys should be really mad at me when we're done with this. Because you're gonna realize that I tortured you with that awful gear project. So let me show you how I would have done that gear project. Using the idea of feature patterning as opposed to sketch patterning the way you guys did it. So I'm gonna start off with a new part, sketch one. And this all goes back to the idea of keep it simple. That awful tooth sketch was just terrible. But the whole point of the exercise was to show you that complicated sketches just make a mess. which is why I never do them. So there we go, we have a six inch diameter disc, just like the gear. I'm gonna sketch on the face. So I'll create a brand new sketch. And let's see, I think I'll go. It's like that. Hundred and ten degrees. Okay, so there's one tooth profile. I'll do an extrude cut. I'll do a through all. Yeah, there's one tooth valley. Now what we can do is we can instance that around, all the way around. I'm gonna go under 
features, and we have linear patterns, and we have circular patterns. I'm going to do a circular pattern. I'm going to choose direction one, and I'm going to say revolve about this edge. 360 degrees equal spacing. I'll put in 30 instances. Something doesn't look right. Top of the teeth are too sharp. I think you made the width too narrow on the top of the gaps. Well, that's the thing. I never set it. So I think it might have adjusted the width when you... Uh... Try decreasing the depth of the, the tooth valley. Ah, uh, thank you. Good call. That's a really good call because you guys should have said, hey, you have a you don't have a fully defined sketch. So if I'd had a fully defined sketch, then I would have got the right geometry. Okay, now I'm fully defined and good to go. Okay, guys, this is so much easier than the way I tortured you with the other one. Okay. So all I ever drew was that little clip triangle. And then I instanced it around but I instanced the feature. So all I have to deal with was those four lines. And then by doing a feature pattern right up here, you get this nice little circular pattern in the part manager. And if I wanna change it, I find this easier to change. I like seeing it over here. Granted, that's a personal preference, but whatever. So if I want to change to a 28 tooth gear, I just type in 28 and I got a 28 tooth gear. And I didn't have to go in and monkey with that god awful sketch. Okay. I would strongly encourage you, if you've got a repeating pattern like this, which you might just see on your homework, okay, it's really better to go with feature patterns. All right, let's do, that's a circular feature pattern. I could just as easily do another sketch and put in the four punch outs and get all of the ribs for that gear. Um, but that's it. So let's see, is there anything else we should talk about in the dialogue? So the first one, we're defining the center of rotation and we don't have to go through all that craziness of constraining the center of rotation or any of that. That all goes away with feature pattern, much, much easier. So you set the center of rotation, however many degrees you want. You know, maybe I only want 180. That would be a really weird gear, but we could do it. So you don't have to go full circle with it. Um, then right here under features and faces, you just select the feature to instance around and it does it. I was gonna say at 180, it looked like you're making radiator fins. Pretty close. I mean, if it wasn't for the overlap and yeah, those wouldn't be bad radiator fins. Okay, so that will be uh, clearer once you do the homework, but there's nothing to it, guys. Any questions on that? Okay. Let's do a rectangular one, because we can do it just the same way. So we could have done that great problem in the same way. 
So we'll delete the pattern. And we'll go in here. I'm going to do a six by six piece of metal. There. Okay, so it's not just cut extrudes that you can use for feature patterning. We could just as easily use the whole wizard. So let's see, I'll do a threaded hole. Do a tap tall. Plop one right there. So always make sure that you can see the little uh, thread decals on the inside. Always make sure that your feature matches the geometry. Then we'll do a linear pattern. So I'm gonna choose direction one. This is a lot like choosing the X and Y direction for the sketch patterning. So I'll choose edge one. We'll choose edge two. So that sets up my X and Y direction. Features and faces, just click on the hole. Bang, we get a preview. So then you can set up the offsets and quantities. Just like last time, if you find that your array is going in the wrong direction, you can use the little arrow toggles. Say okay, and there you go, pattern of holes. If I wanna change it, so let's say that I wanna go with a plain drilled hole instead I can say, okay, pattern automatically updates. So nothing gets screwed up. And you can see all of our threads went away. Uh, I mean, do you need to see another one guys or would I bore you to death? I mean, it's, it's just not hard. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You good with it? Anybody else want further explanation? Okay. Let's see what else we got, and then I'll let you guys get on with the homework. So that was patterning. Basically, you just set the X and Y you set the offsets, the direction, and you're good. And you can use either axes, you can use circular edges, anything you want like that for your center of rotation. Okay, suppressing. This lecture is kind of a hodgepodge of stuff that I need to show you. So 
sometimes you might need to turn a feature off. Maybe you're going to go in and you want to see and see a part uh, without all the holes, something like that. Maybe you're going to do a custom one-off to experiment with, something like that. Okay, so all of these features in the part manager, they can all be turned off. So for example, if I click on the pattern and I come up here to suppress, that suppresses the array of holes. If I come up here, I can suppress the initial instance. Okay. So just know that suppressing is out there. It is a thing um, and feel free to use it. That said, when you guys go to work for Ferrari and you're making the new you know, 2040 Ferrari engine and you have to hand in your parts to the part managing person, do not ever, ever, ever make a production part and leave something suppressed. Always leave it fully turned on. Otherwise, you're going to cause huge confusion. Okay. The other thing you can do along the same lines of suppression, if you grab the little blue bar right here, see how it forms a little hand symbol? You can go back and you can step through how the initial creator made the part. So for example, I started off with a block. I can pull the blue line down and it says, then I did the first quarter inch hole. Then I pulled the blue line down some more and it puts the pattern in. It's kind of like another form of suppression. I find this very useful when I've got complex parts done by somebody else. I'll put the blue line all the way up at the top and then I'll just drag it down to get an overview of what they were thinking and how they made it. So, nice little technique, works well. Okay, so suppressing, that's turning off features. Don't ever save your stuff with stuff suppressed. Everything should be turned on. Video demonstration. Okay, the last stuff we're going to do in this hodgepodge is measuring. Let's try this one. And measuring will be important if you guys go for some of the SOLIDWORKS exams. Because the way they do it is they make you do a bunch of work and then they look for things like the center of gravity and that's how they evaluate your work to see if it was done properly. Because they can't actually look and say, is this the same entity? Is this what I assigned you to make? Okay, so to do the measurement tool, you can either click on the evaluate tab or you can come under, let's see. I thought it was, oh, under tools, evaluate. And then this stuff gives you the same items that are on the command manager. Okay, let's just choose the measure tool for now. So if I wanna measure the distance from that edge to the other edge, I can just click on the two and the distance is six inches, okay? If I wanna go from this corner to the other corner, we have a distance of 6.08 blah, blah, blah inches. And it is nice, be careful which one you look at. Make sure you always look at the distance because you do get the Z component and the X component. If I go in three dimensions, I'll get an X, Y, and Z component. And then your distance becomes the Pythagorean relation. Okay. Do the same thing. So you have options of how you're gonna handle holes. 
if I wanted to know what the spacing was between my holes, okay, typically you're, wanting, you're gonna wanna go center to center. So I'll click on the edge, the other edge, and I get a distance of a quarter inch. So from the Evaluate tab, and again, you get all the components. Okay, so that's how you measure distances. The other thing you might want to know about this block is what's the weight of it. So let's apply a material. I'm going to choose probably one of the most common aluminums out there. Uh, 6061T6. Whenever I go to Bangor Steel and I say, aluminum please, this is what they give me. And Professor Young will teach you all about the different alloys of aluminum. So if I want to know the weight of this block, I just hit mass properties. It's choosing the entire part and there it is. So it assigned a density of 0.1 pounds per cubic inch. And this plate weighs 3.44 pounds. That's pretty jazzy. Okay, let's see. Oh, it's still giving me, I was hoping to do just the area of the face. So you can set all your accuracy levels. Okay, so right here, that was my mistake. If you go back under the tape measure where we were measuring distances and you just click on a face, it will give you the area and perimeter of the face. Now that might be interesting for, I don't know, wing surface area, something like that, which we'll get to later in the course. Okay, so as always, we have homework. We're doing lesson five, so part one, due for Monday morning, 8 a.m. You have an automotive brake drum. And I see a bunch of holes in a circular pattern. What might you ever do with that? So that'll be the first one. Notice from now on, I'm gonna have materials on the print. Make sure that you apply the material so that you get full credit. There's the first one. Part two. Part two, really simple. I mean, it's pretty much just what I did. It's a block with six holes. Really good setup for a linear pattern of features. And then same thing, only I've changed the hole type. So the first one was for flathead screws. This one is for uh, countersunk flush fasteners. Or you could put a, a hex head in there. Okay, so don't get all balled up about doing custom dimensions. Make sure you go into the hole wizard and you just say you want a counterbore hole for a 3 8 hex head screw. And then if you just tell it this, you should get all of this geometry automatically. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, on that note, uh, if there are no questions, go ahead and start the homework. We'll have the rest of the class for just Q&A, and there you go. Are there any questions on anything I've talked about? I think once you do it once, it'll be crystal clear. All right, rest of the time is yours. Go for it. I'm not going to lie. Looking at the designer now for that, that three cylinder one you had pointed out. Yeah. It'd be easy enough to make an inline four of it. There's actually some really cool inline fours. Um, I'll have to send you a link gauge. Uh, there's a company called Sun Power, and they were making a really nice four cylinder. Sterling engine that was a backup home APU. Or actually, no, I shouldn't say backup APU. It was, it was a combined heat and power unit. So they were burning propane over the top and generating electricity with the thing using the waste heat for home space heating. I thought it was just an amazing little unit. So the power of this three cell of this three cylinder Sterling engine alone is actually kind of impressive. I was expecting a lot less. Yeah, the tin can engines, they just barely have enough power to overcome their own friction. But I've seen some multi-cylinder ones that uh, a guy was powering a canoe with. Oh my he, god, it just revved up. What the Yeah. There's a point in the video like halfway through where it just immediately goes, nope, we're going to go faster now. Yeah, there's one video. The guy's got it cranked up to like 3,500 RPM. You know, the issue is, though is what I'm seeing from this. The crankshaft is really unstable. Oh, yeah. Because there's no balance weights on it. It's, so yeah, it's shifting the mass of the freaking wheel that it's spinning. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at a modern car crankshaft, it's all counterbalanced so that the mass of the piston rod, the piston, the rings, everything stays right about the center of rotation for the crankshaft. I don't know how my tractor even works. It doesn't have a counterbalanced crankshaft. And I would have thought that thing would have shaken itself to death. But you know what I'm seeing is like when this thing hits high revs, it starts shifting around and then it completely throws off its entire timing. Yeah, absolutely. The timing is critical on those. Um, I have a question. Shoot, go ahead. I was wondering if I could share my screen. I'm getting a message every time I try to use the whole wizard. Okay, um, go ahead. Hang on. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> you see my. You just see my SolidWorks, or? Yeah, I just see your SolidWorks. Okay, cool. Yeah, so. I just want to like. Oh, I found an inline four. So yeah, if I just select the whole wizard, it gives me this every time. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we're going to have to go back into your mapping. Hmm. It's weird because it was working. Good enough, the homework and stuff. 
Okay, I'm going to take the screen back. And let me get rid of this. So the way you're going to solve that, I'm going to use the little gear icon to go into my options. And let's see. File locations. So I'm thinking, hmm. okay, so it's not the whole wizard's favorite database. I wish this picture was, this video was better quality. I can't really see what they did here. This one looks like they actually counterbalanced it. But I can't figure out what they used. It looks like a bunch of screws. Well, not screws. Like little, yeah, little screws. Which there's is not a, right. There's a bunch of people that have used uh, wire connectors. Let's see. So then if I come over to C, program files. SolidWorks Corp. SolidWorks Language English. Okay, so Here's all of my stuff for the whole wizard. Do you see the same thing on your system? Uh, so you got there going through. Hang on. Yeah. Um. C, program files, SolidWorks Corp, SolidWorks Language English. Um, yeah, I don't have anything even through any one of those. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I wonder what, do you know any idea why that would have happened? I mean, I was no using it. No earthly idea. Okay. So let's do this. Okay, David, so there is my files in your inbox. Take the contents of that zip folder and put those right where I've got it. So C, program file, SolidWorks core, SolidWorks language English. Okay.
then you may have to restart SolidWorks. I'm not gonna lie, that four cylinder is the largest thing I've seen in any of these any of these videos other than the sixteen cylinder aerosol one they're doing. That would be painful. It has a, was a swash coupling they said? Yeah. That's disgusting. It's I don't like it. They have it in they literally have it in like a cylindrical array. It looks like you're Ew. Yeah, that's the way the sun power uh, combined heat and power unit was done. I don't like it. Yeah. I don't like it one bit. That was actually a pretty slick unit. Uh, that ran pressurized helium instead of air inside. One of the problems with Stirling engines is they're really, they can be really efficient, uh, but they're really hard to throttle, which is why they never took off for the automotive industry. There were some attempts to use them in mail vans, but it just, it never worked out. There's a great story about Robert Stirling building the first Stirling engines. Uh, he was powering a cotton mill and his engine was like two or three times more efficient than a steam engine. But the problem was all he had was cast iron back in the day. And they ran the engine so hot that the iron would just oxidize away. So even though he was burning far less fuel, he couldn't keep the thing running and they had to go back to the steam engine. Today we have stainless steels and ink canals and it's not nearly the problem that it used to be. The guys that are doing the cutting edge solar stuff, uh, at least back in the 80s and 90s, they were running Stirling engines with 3000 PSI helium. That was just scary. You know, from what I'm seeing with like, all the designs I'm seeing, like the one you showed has a pipe coming out the side and that's where the balloon's operating the crankshaft there. Right. What I'm seeing in all these other ones is that they're running the balloon inside and like a bottom half of another can. So they took two cans, created a housing on the top and then had um, right. the balloon inside. In We've the had a couple can. people do those. We've never had one run in this class. You're totally welcome to try it. I mean, again, this is not an engines class. This yeah, is all I, about how good your CAD package is. That's why I'm trying to think, I'm looking at it, I'm trying to think how they did it. I think a bunch of them end up gluing a push rod to the balloon itself. That would make sense because I am seeing they pretty much attached it right on. Right. As soon as you go piercing the balloon, your chance of leakage is really high. Exactly. Just use some flex seal, it'll be fine. A little I, bit of liquid rubber. I go for it. <laughs> Try it. As long as you specify it in the bill of materials and show me, you know, where to buy it and all that stuff, how to apply it, I'm good with that. Go to your local hardware store. 
Well, like on the balloons, you're going to have to tell me the Walmart part number and all of that. And that's in that list of parts um, for the baggie. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you should be able to give this design package to your grandmother and she should be able to put together a working engine. I don't know about that one. <laughs> well, you know. hey, you got you to give grandmothers credit. I think it's the reason my grandfather's the mechanic. So in my generation, my grandmother, she was part of the Rosie the Riveter uh, World War II production generation. Nice. Yeah. You couldn't fault those ladies. They got it done. They did. Um, I'm still having an issue. I'm having an issue. I'm at the file location, but it's kind of odd. I'm saying I don't have permission to put the, these files here or something. A little show, bit confused. Go ahead and show me. Your I hate screen, to use Davis. class time on this, but while you're here, no, this is this is perfectly fine. This is probably the fastest way to get your problem resolved. So yeah, I found the file location here when I was looking before when you were showing me, and it looks the exact same as here where I'm trying to jump dump this um, zip folder you sent me. Okay, so none of the so first off, don't put the zip folder there. Open up the zip folder, copy the contents. Okay, that might okay. There you go. There you go, much better. Okay. Now go back over to your SolidWorks folder. Oh, hang on, hang on. You've got it right to your right. Huh? You're not in the right folder. No. See to the right, you got to go to SolidWorks Corp, SolidWorks Language English. Okay, now go and paste into that folder. What? Just get out of the bottom and paste somewhere. Oh. Yeah, I just found it. They hot glued it in. This is just in a single cylinder one. They just hot glued in the piston. Oh. The plunger. Uh, I don't know. I'm the main confused. Well, thank you. Okay. So just get out of all that stuff and try restarting SolidWorks. It looks like you've got got the files where they should be now. Yeah. Okay, guys, so we're at nine o'clock. Does anybody have any final questions on what you're looking at? Uh, I got a yes. quick question. Yeah, go ahead, Aiden. Okay, so uh, should I share, share my screen? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, that so I've got my hole on. Nice. Good. Lock. Yep. And I just 
do linear pattern, right? Yep. It's just a problem is it says direction one is like in the Z direction. Yeah, so go up to the direction one box at the top, click in there and click yeah. the top edge so that you have a linear direction. There you go. Click. Okay. Thank you. And then for direction two, same thing. Choose an edge so you're pointing in a direction. And then it'll all work fine. I want that one inside. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, I got a quick question real quick. Yeah, Logan. Um, I'll share my screen. So um, it's giving me like a tolerance when I do a smart dimension. I don't know how to fix that, I guess. Why is that even there? How did it get there? Uh, when I smart dimensioned, like, uh, I'll delete it. Okay. I did this. It, like, oh, okay. Up. Yeah, you don't want to do that because that's not in a sketch. Okay, oh, so okay. delete that. Okay. Okay. So let's go to sketch one. Good. So you got everything you need right there. So that's good. Let's exit out of that sketch. And then expand uh, countersink for three eighths flathead machine screw. Yeah, hit the little triangle next to it. So you've already placed the hole and that's yep. the location's fully defined. So you don't need anything else. Okay. Um, the other thing is, it's probably not like a question for this because I could like figure it out myself, but I figured out how far apart they were and it's like 1.125 inches. Yep. And then I went and measured it again and it's giving me, uh, so I don't know if this will work or not, but. So you don't want to do smart dimension. All right, great. Yeah, use the uh, measurement tool. Uh, Evaluate, measure, good. And then it's giving me like three point, like instead of 0.75, like on the other side, it's 0 0.91. I don't know if that's right or not, but. I would just go back in and check your dimensions. Okay. Right. And then you can drag those little dialogues around. Sometimes they're hiding stuff you want to look at. Mm -hmm. I mean, just looking at it offhand, it looks good. Yeah, yeah. all right, I, I can figure it out. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions before we have to park company? No. Ashley, you have a very intense stare going on. I'm just looking at the part I'm trying to see. I had a quick question. I yes, Sam, go ahead. Real quick. Yep, all yours. Can you see that part? Yes. Um, so I'm not sure if the way I did it was correct, but I just made a circle, extruded it, and then shelled it to... There are any number of ways you could draw that part. Okay. And, and as then, long as your geometry matches what's on the print, I don't care. Okay. Is there a way to... Well, actually, would, would that, that wouldn't count as extruding cut a circle, right, if you shelled this? Not if you shelled it, no. Okay. No, that's but then to you, totally you, fine. That's completely legit. Okay. Is there a way to measure this this distance here with like without just going making a sketch or something? Yeah. So go up to measure. You're already in the evaluate tab. And then and then see see the measurement dialogue in your upper left. Uh, measurement dialogue up here. Yeah, it's a little rectangular box. No, more to the left. More left. More left. More, more, more. More, more. Almost <laughs> off the screen to the left. 
on my screen go two inches to the left oh it's that's off the screen for me is it oh. down here somewhere uh yeah let me try going full screen here okay so now oh, over, over here yep okay so bottom row all the way to the left hit that little drop down and see how you've got like minimum distance. I think that's what you want. Oops, you got a face instead. So you got one edge, one face. Try measuring again. Okay. Okay. So okay. then it gave me, that's the correct. Well, I, I put it as 0.3125. I assume that's what it was supposed to be, so. Yes. Okay. Okay. So just one thought while we're on this screen, I'm looking at your part manager and it says that you're going to use a one thirty second drill bit to make a two inch hole. Yep. Probably so not a good idea. That. Yep. Just edit it. You probably break a lot of drill bits doing that. Okay. Yep. And then this inside you would just use a fillet or something to Sure, that, that okay. would be fine. I think when, right. I, when I did it, I did a body of revolution, uh, but the way you're doing it is fine. I mean. Okay, thank you. Yep. No problem. Uh, I had a quick question. Yeah, quick Ethan, quick. go ahead. Uh, when I drew the uh, brake drum, Yep. I did it as I drew like the profile of it and then I revolved it around the axes. Is that okay? A perfectly fine. Yep. Okay. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, you could do it as extruded cylinders and shell. Uh, you could do it as a whole bunch of extrusions. I did it as a body of revolution. You know, whenever I see something round that has a fairly uniform cross section, I immediately think body of revolution. Um, but yeah, as long as you give me a good solid model and the model matches uh, the geometry called out on the print, I'm all good with that. Right, the only thanks. things I really get crazy on, I spelled out in the how to fail MEE 120 video. That's like cutting extruding circles or not turning your hidden lines on or dimensioning to external sketches. As long as you don't do that stuff, I'm good. Okay, I cut somebody off. Okay, guys, I'm going to end the recording here.